Today, we're going to look at some temporal coherence applications. And recall from our previous lectures that we define temporal coherence in terms of the Michelson interferometer, although the concept is independent of any particular piece of hardware, the Michelson interferometer is a very useful way to measure temporal coherence, and in fact, as we'll see, is very useful in applications. So at the heart of the Michelson interferometer is a beam splitter, and then we've got two mirrors, one on top, let's call that mirror M1, and this one at the side, mirror M2, and mirror M2 is at a distance from the center of the beam splitter, which is equal to D2, and mirror M1 is at a distance from the center of the beam splitter, which is D1, which is equal to D2 minus H. So that mirror M1 is movable. It can move up and down as we change this parameter H. If H is equal to zero, the two legs have the same length. Down here we have a, a lens. Over here we've got a lens. And then here we've got a source. And over here we've got a detector. So the source produces a field with amplitude G at T. And at the detector, we detect the time average intensity of the field following, uh, falling on that detector. And so this point source is collimated into a plane wave by this first lens. The beam splitter breaks it up into the two paths, two arms, equal amplitudes. They come back and they're combined together. And finally, they're focused down onto the detector. And we worked out that the detector intensity as a function of the displacement H can be written as two I zero times one plus the real part gamma of tau, where tau, the time, relative time delay, is depends on this uh, displacement h as 2h over c, and the gamma of tau, which specifies the temporal coherence properties of the source, is the time average of g of t plus tau times g conjugate of t, and then it's normalized so that if tau is equal to zero, it's equal to one, we divide by i zero, which is just, or if we want to be a little more explicit, we could just say divide that by the time average magnitude of g t squared. So we're gonna look at uh, basically three applications here of the Michelson interferometer, which are applications of temporal coherence. And the first follows very directly from something we've already demonstrated, that there is a Fourier transform relationship between this gamma a tau and the power spectrum of the source. And that leads to Fourier transform spectroscopy. This is most effective for infrared light, and so it's usually called FTIR, Fourier Transform Infrared. And it's based on the fact that, as we've shown previously, S of nu, which is the power spectrum of the source G at T, is Fourier Transform of little gamma of tau. S of nu is a 
normalized power spectrum, normalized so that the total uh, integral of it is equal to 1. So that's one application. Another follows from what we've talked about in uh, seeing fringes as interference fringes as we change the parameter h, and that is the measurement of small displacements. The Michelin interferometer is so effective at measuring small displacements that this was the basis of the meter definition between 1960 and 19. 83, and more recently, it has been used for the detection of gravitational waves. A third application we're going to look at is three-dimensional imaging. One, which is very useful for surface profiling, is called optical coherence radar, and a slight variation, which is useful for looking into transparent or slightly translucent uh, media is called optical coherence tomography. As we mentioned in a previous lecture, tomography comes from uh, the idea of making a, an image of a slice of something. So we'll see how that works. As we've said, ID of H, the time average detector intensity as a function of the mirror one displacement is two I zero one plus the real part of gamma of tau, where tau is two H over C. So if we measure ID of H, we can turn around and solve for the real part of gamma of tau. Uh, divide by 2i0 and then subtract 1, so we get id of h over 2i0 minus 1. Okay, so we can determine the real part of gamma of tau. And as we've already shown, s of nu is equal to the Fourier transform of gamma of tau. And remember that is a normalized power spectrum of the source. So we take the Fourier transform of the source oscillation, g of t, that gives us big G of nu, magnitude squared of that, and then we divide by the integral of the magnitude squared of that. And that is real. It's a real function. So this is, at least at first glance, a very straightforward application of the Michelson interferometer. Measure ID of H, solve for gamma of tau, take a Fourier transform, and now you've got the power spectrum of the source. A slight wrinkle is that we actually don't get gamma of tau. We get the real part of gamma of tau. So let's see how we resolve this problem. Gamma of tau, well, because its Fourier transform is S of nu, uh, the inverse Fourier transform of S, S of nu is gamma of tau. So gamma of tau is equal to the integral S of nu e to the minus i 2 pi nu tau d nu. And we assume we have only positive frequencies in our source. So... Right, only 
terms of the form e to the minus i 2 pi nu tau, where nu is positive. So that's gamma of tau. Well, let's look at gamma conjugate of tau. Why? Because the real part of gamma is one half gamma plus the conjugate of gamma. So the conjugate of gamma is, well, s is real. So the only thing that happens is this exponential gets conjugated. So we get s of nu e to the plus i, 2 pi nu tau d nu. And now we write that the real part of gamma of tau is one half the sum of these two expressions. Well, if we sum them, we can just combine their integrands, and, and they have a common factor of s and nu. So we're really just combining these two complex exponentials. So we're going to get the integral from 0 to infinity, s of nu, and 1 half e to the i 2 pi nu tau plus e to the minus i 2 pi nu tau d nu. But we recognize that sum as just cosine of 2 pi nu tau. So this is equal then to the integral from 0 to infinity s of nu cosine 2 pi nu tau d tau. So this is what we can determine. And we need to invert this integral to figure out s of nu. So toward the end, we can look at the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the real part, gamma tau times cosine 2 pi mu tau d tau. And that is equal to the integral from minus infinity to infinity, plugging in for the real part of gamma tau that we had on the previous board. Well, that is the integral from 0 to infinity of s of nu cosine 2 pi nu tau d nu. And then times your cosine 2 pi mu tau d tau. Then we can change the order of integration, move the new integration outside. So we get the integral from 0 to infinity, s of nu, all the terms that depend on tau, we put in here in this integral from minus infinity to infinity of cosine 2 pi nu tau times cosine 2 pi mu tau d tau. And then that whole thing is integrated d nu. So, um, Obviously, if mu and nu are equal, then this is just cosine squared of 2 pi nu tau, which has an average value of 1 half. We integrate it from minus infinity to infinity. That's going to be infinity. If nu and mu differ, well, then this is going to be an oscillating function, and its average value is going to be 0. And in the PDF notes, we show with more rigor that this is equal to 1 half delta of nu minus mu. And therefore, when you integrate s of nu times delta of nu minus mu, d nu, well, you just pull out the one half, and then you get s of mu. This is equal to one half s of mu. So that tells us then that one half s of mu is equal to this integral. So s of, and now I'm going to use nu again instead of mu, which was kind of a dummy variable in this. That's just equal to two times this integral up here, minus infinity to infinity, 
the real part gamma of tau times the cosine 2 pi nu tau d tau. And again, that's proportional to the magnitude of g of nu squared, the power spectrum of the optical source. So this is the thing that we can actually get from the interferogram that comes out of the Michelson interferometer, and then this calculation allows us to get s and nu. Now, remember that uh, tau is 2h over c, and uh, we actually can't integrate from minus infinity to infinity in tau because we can't move the mirrors an infinite distance. There's some limit to the amount of um, h that we can actually move the mirrors. Suppose we can move the mirrors a maximum of delta h equals one meter, which would be a very large high precision Michelson interferometer. Well, let's see what happens. If we're, we have a, a limit, uh, a total uh, variation of tau, of delta tau, then this would become, these would become integrals from minus delta tau over two to delta tau over two. And so the magnitude of tau would be less than or equal to delta tau of two, and the corresponding resolution in frequency would be one over that interval in time. So one over delta tau. That would be your spectral resolution. And let's see. So with this uh, delta H of one meter, well, delta tau would be two times one over C, and this delta nu would be one over that, would be C over two meters. C is 300 million meters per second, so divided by two meters, that would be 150 per second, or 150 megahertz. Um, and so, uh, if you had an interferometer with a one meter um, travel on the movable mirror, you could measure the power spectrum of a source to a resolution of 150 megahertz. And that's a very fine resolution when you realize that the optical frequencies are typically 10 to the 14th and greater hertz. Now, imagine in the output stage, here's our beam splitter, and we've got these beams coming out. They combine into one beam. And then in that beam, we insert a sample of something. And suppose that sample is characterized by an absorption spectrum H of nu. Then out of that sample is going to come A modified beam and that will then fall on the lens and be focused down to the detector and then we can again measure ID of H So, how will this change things? So this could be, for example, a uh, little chamber that holds a gas, or it could be 
a, a liquid or whatever it is, some sample, we just put it in front of this beam that's finally at the output of the Michelson interferometer. And now this sample is going to absorb some of that um, incident field as a function of frequency. All right, so we got basically what happens then if we have a field coming in that has a spectrum G of nu, what comes out is going to have a spectrum G of nu times H of nu. And which H, that represents how much typically H of nu would be less than or equal to one in magnitude, meaning it, it's, it's a passive um, filter in a sense. It just absorbs energy. So this would be an absorption spectrum. So if we use this system in FTIR, then we're going to get an output power spectrum that's going to be proportional to the magnitude of g and nu squared times the magnitude of h of nu squared. So here's what we do. First, we run this our Michelson interferometer with uh, no sample present, or if this is a little chamber, we have it evacuated, and we measure the power spectrum of the optical source. Then we put the sample in place or fill up the chamber. And we measure magnitude g of nu squared times magnitude h of nu squared. Finally, we calculate the ratio of these two g of nu squared magnitude h of nu squared over the magnitude g of nu squared is the magnitude h of nu squared. And in that manner, we can determine the absorption spectrum of a sample. So this is extremely useful to detect the spectral, quote, fingerprints of chemicals, maybe in gaseous state or other states. So if you take a system like this and you miniaturize it and, and uh, play some technological tricks to speed up the whole FTI process, you can make a device that can go out in the field and detect uh, different chemicals because we know what each chemical's absorption spectrum is. And so we can look at this absorption spectrum of a sample and determine which components, which chemical components are present. So remember what a typical interferogram would look like. We'll assume we have a, a Gaussian line. And so the interferogram would look something like this, although typically the, the actual fringe frequency would be much, much higher. You'd have many more fringes present, but that's kind of hard to draw. So I'm going to draw it like this. And, um, the distance, oops, the distance between fringes is one over the center frequency. We'll call that delta tau. And the distance over which 
the uh, the envelope falls off significantly is one over delta nu, or that's the spectral width. So for a Gaussian line, we'd have ID of H is equal to two I zero one plus E to the minus pi delta nu tau squared cosine two pi nu zero tau. And we assume that delta nu is much, much less than nu zero. So it's a very relatively narrow uh, bandwidth signal. So this one over delta nu is, is quite a bit bigger than one over nu zero. And recall that tau is 2h over c, where h is the displacement of the movable mirror. So delta h is then c over 2 delta tau from this relationship, which is equal to, because delta tau is 1 over nu 0, that's equal to c over 2 nu zero, and the speed of light over frequency is the wavelength. So that's equal to lambda zero over two, something we've already mentioned. Um, the distance that the mirror has to move so that we go through one fringe is one half of a wavelength. So using this system, we could very easily measure a half a wavelength. So if wavelength is half a micron, we can measure a quarter of a micron quite easy with this system. And that's, of course, going through an entire fringe. You can actually detect when you've gone through only a fraction of a fringe as a practical matter. You might be able to measure about a fifth of that or about a tenth of a wavelength. So if we take a line emitted by a particular a gas, krypton, isotope 86, it has a line at a wavelength lambda zero, which is 605.78 nanometers and has a spectral width um, in uh, wavelengths, delta lambda, of 0 0.000. Or nine nanometers. And so the coherence length for a Gaussian line is lambda zero over square root of two, lambda zero over delta lambda. And this works out to be 530 millimeters, a little more than half of a meter. So from 1960 to 1983, this was the basis for defining the meter as exactly 1,650,763.73 of these wavelengths. Another way to think about that is then if we just take the inverse of that, solve for lambda zero here, that's equivalent to saying what people did was to define the wavelength of this particular uh, emission line to be exactly 605.7802106 nanometers. So instead uh, of the meter being defined as the distance between two scratches on a platinum bar that's kept in Paris, now anybody that had a Michael's interferometer and a sample of Krypton-86 gas could actually measure it themselves. Okay, so much more useful. Now since then, we found even more accurate, more precise ways to define the meter. And these days what we do is we define the second based on a particular atomic oscillation, 
And then we define the meter by fixing the speed of light to be a certain number of meters per second. Here's an interesting variation on that measuring of small displacements. Go back to our Michelson interferometer. So we've got a source creating a spherical wave, which is collimated into a plane wave, breaks up into two pieces, go into the two arms of the, or the two legs, whatever you want to call it, of the interferometer. They come back together, and they're focused down onto the detector. So here's your ID, and up here is your G of T. Now, let's do this. Let's um, have mirror M1, a distance D1, from the beam splitter, and mirror M2, a distance D2, is equal to D1 from the beam splitter. Both mirrors now are fixed. So how do we get variation to develop an interferogram? Well, we're going to place in one of these arms a sample, say it's a little chamber of width W, and it's going to have a gas in there at a pressure P. So as before, we're going to get ID is going to be 2I0, 1 plus cosine 2 pi nu 0 tau. And so let's assume this is a highly coherent beam. We can treat it like a perfectly monochromatic signal. And then the question is, well, where do we get the tau? If these two distances are fixed, they're equal, tau would always be 0. Except, no, tau is going to be the time delay due to the gas in the chamber. Why is that? Well, because that gas is going to have some index of refraction. If we assume that the index of refraction everywhere else is equal to 1, then this time delay is going to be, let's see, so the round trip time through that chamber is going to be 2 w over C. And if the index of refraction was 1, okay, that would just be part of the total round trip time for this leg of the interferometer. But if now it has an index of refraction that's greater than 1, the added time is going to be n, and n is going to be a function of the pressure, minus 1. So if we evacuate the chamber, then we're going to get tau is equal to zero. As we start allowing gas to go into the chamber, the pressure is going to increase, the index of refraction is going to increase, and this time delay is going to increase. Now it's a time delay not due a, to a physical change in the length, but due to an optical change in the length, a change in the optical path. This is 2w over c, and a pretty good model for this variation with pressure would just be some constant n0 minus 1 times p over p0, where n of some reference pressure p0 is n0. In other words, it's pretty well approximated as being linear with the pressure. So as the density of the gas increases, the index of refraction increases accordingly. So now, ID is a function of pressure, P, not of mere displacement, H. It's going to be 2I0, 1 plus the cosine, and we just plug in here, 2 pi, nu 0, and tau, 
we're going to write it as n0 minus 1 2w over c p over p0. So what happens? So we start off uh, with this at p is equal to 0. Of course, this is equal to 0. So it's just at its peak, the two arms have the same optical length. And then we start allowing gas to go into the chamber as it does. This varies with pressure. And so we start to see fringes. And so we're going to see the interferogram go through fringes as a function of the pressure P. So as the pressure varies from 0 to P0, I D of P goes through how many fringes? Well, you end up, how many two pi's of phase does this go through? Well, it starts at zero, and it ends up as, well, let's see, nu zero over C, that's one over lambda. So we can write this as N zero minus one times two W over lambda zero, and we end up at P is equal to P zero, so this is one. So that will be the number of two pi's this goes through, which is the number of fringes this goes through. And let's call that n sub f, number of fringes. And what we can do then is solve for n0. n0 then is going to be 1 plus, multiply both sides by lambda 0 over 2w, we get lambda 0 over 2w times the number of fringes. So by counting the number of fringes, we can determine very precisely the index of refraction at that final pressure. So this is another application of temporal coherence and the Michelson interferometer. Now we're going to look at LIGO, which stands for Laser Interferometer. gravitational wave observatory. And here's one of the LIGO stations over here. There are two, one in Washington State and one in Louisiana State. It is, uh, these two are the largest Michelson interferometer in the world, I believe. So this is an aerial view. Here's down where the beam splitter and the optical source and detectors are. And then here are the two interferometer arms. This is a close-up of one of them. These are concrete cylinders, and they're pulled down to a very high vacuum. The system operates with a wavelength of 1064 nanometers, infrared, a power output of about 125 watts, and the interferometer arms are about four kilometers. So that's this length here. So the two mirrors, M1 and M2, remember that Michelson interferometer gives us interference fringes when there's a relative change in the paths in the two legs of the interferometer. And for LIGO, that occurs because the mirrors, the two mirrors at the ends here, move. And they move because they are in, quote, free fall. Parallel to the Earth. Now, they're not free in free fall up and down. Otherwise, they just fall on the ground in the direction of the gravitational field. But they're in free fall because... Uh, parallel to the Earth because they're suspended with a pendulum system. This is a gross exaggeration here, but here's one of the mirrors. And here is an angle theta. Gravity is pointing down. And so the mirror can swing back and forth. Now, it's a submicroscopic swing. 
And these uh, pendulum systems are amazing works of engineering. They're a quadruple pendulum with all kinds of high-tech stuff. But this is the basic idea. The mirror is free to swing back and forth. And that allows it to be sensitive to gravitational waves. Relativity, which we'll look a little bit at in a later lecture, predicts The gravitational wave of amplitude, oops, amplitude A would cause the lengths of these two arms to oscillate in the form, so let's say the uh, arm one has a distance a D1, so that'd be D1 zeros when there's no wave present. And then with the wave present, it would look like that times one plus the amplitude A, and then it would vary sinusoidally. And the other arm would look like D2 zero and one minus A. And so if these two arms uh, are oscillating because the mirrors are moving back and forth in response to a gravitational wave, then as you get the interference between the light from these two paths, you're going to see an interferogram and determined by the tau that comes from these two path differences. Now, a very challenging aspect of this is that the amplitude A of a typical gravitational wave we might expect to see uh, would be on the order of 10 to the minus 21 very very small right so that would mean a change in the distance of each of these arms by about one part in 10 to the 21 that's incredibly small the way ligo is able to do that is by having a lot of playing a lot of tricks with optics so let's see the first thing it does is it uses two mirrors in each leg such that the wave bounces back and forth many times. So here's your four kilometers. It actually goes through here and bounces many, many times before it comes out. Uh, this mirror here has a tr transmission coefficient of 1.4%. So it means it spends a lot of time bouncing back and forth, about 200 times. So if we take four kilometers times 200, uh, of course, that's 800 kilometers. That effectively makes the two legs each 800 kilometers. Okay, so you get these bouncing back and forth there. Or maybe I'll just draw it like that. Here's the two mirrors that are in free fall. Now still, that's a challenge because if we take 800 kilometers, um, and remember one of the legs is gonna grow and one's gonna shrink and then vice versa. So we'll get a factor of two for the path difference. So two times 800 kilometers times the gravitational wave amplitude of 10 to the minus 21. And that works out to be 1.6 femtometers, femto being 10 to the minus 15th. How small is that? Well, that's about the size of a proton, of a nucleus of a hydrogen atom. So you can see why for many decades people thought it was virtually impossible to ever detect gravitational waves. Because your interferogram would look like ID is 2I0. Um, and if we set things up so that when the relative distance between the uh, path length between the two arms is, is 0, um, the interferogram is just at 2i0, so in other words, we replace the cosine by a sine. We could do that just by slightly varying the distance in uh, the length of one of the arms when it's at, with no gravitational wave present. Then we would get with a gravitational wave, id would be 2i0, 1 plus sine, 2 pi, nu 0, um, 2h over c, where h is on the order of the size of a proton. And so if you look at that, what is that phase? That change of phase is on the order of about 10 to the minus 
10 radians, very, very tiny. And so the change in the detector intensity, intensity is on the order of about, because of this two here, um, is on the order of about two times 10 to the minus 10th times I zero. So you're looking at a change of about a tenth of a billionth of the intensity. So that's a very, very, very small change in the intensity. And so various tricks are used to achieve that. So this is a schematic of the LIGO system. So you'll notice here, um, mode cleaners at the input and output, those filter the, uh, the wave, make it extremely clean. There are these three mirrors here, PR, these are for power recycling mirrors. So they take some of the signal, you remember in a, in a beam splitter, in a micro interferometer, half of the beam goes one way, half goes the other. When these come back, half goes through, but half comes back towards the original source. And so these recycle that and feed it back into the system to cause that to build up. You can see here you go from about 125 watts coming out of the laser effectively to over five kilowatts effective power because of that recycling. You also recycle at the signal, SM, SRM is signal recycling mirrors that also takes the signals that come out and bounces them back in. So you're doing all kinds of things to build up the power because the Waves are bouncing back and forth about 200 times here in the two arms. That builds up to about 750 kilowatts of intensity. And so you get very high intensities, and therefore this I0 is, is very, very large. And so that gives you more hope to, to measure this very, very small amount. Still, it, it's an extreme measurement. And we will come back to this when we study... Uh, the problem of optical detection when you're basically we'll, we'll see that light is actually composed of discrete particles discrete quanta of energy called photons and so this problem of detecting a change in intensity really is a problem of counting photons and so we'll look at the statistics of that anyway LIGO through amazing engineering and design is able to do that and here was the first gravitational wave detected this was the signal at LIGO Hanford you can see here's the 10 to the minus 21 is about the peak amplitude here's at LIGO Livingston in uh, in Louisiana and here they are uh, superimposed on each other you got to have two of these stations because if you just saw one of these well you might think well you know maybe a, a truck drove by or there was some sort of noise in the system whatever but if you see two stations that are you know thousands of kilometers apart and they have the identical signal well now you can have a high degree of confidence that that has a gravitational wave and in fact this was identified as the gravitational wave of two black holes spiraling in and coalescing some uh, many billions of light years away a variation on the michelson interferometer leads to a system that implements optical coherence radar. So let's uh, take a look at this. Here is the beam splitter of our Michelson interferometer. Now it's gonna be oriented slightly differently. We're gonna put our source up at the top. So we're basically rotating everything by 90 degrees here. And we have a, a lens. Down here will be a fixed mirror, M2. And over here, where we normally would have our movable mirror, we're gonna replace that by an object, a physical object, solid object. Uh, the distance to mirror 2 will be D2, and the distance to the base of this object will be D2 minus H. <clears throat> and the object is uh, replaces the movable mirror and can move, so we can change the parameter H. Then over here, we've got the lens focal length F1, 
and way over here, a lens of focal length f2. And then here is our detector, which now is not a single detector, but instead is an array of detectors. It is an image sensor, like you would have in an electronic camera. So we, what we're going to do here, basically, we're adding an imaging system into the Michelson interferometer. So signal comes out here of the source, goes into the beam splitter, splits up. Half of that comes out as a plane wave and illuminates this object. The other half comes out and illuminates this mirror. Of course, reflects back. Now let's trace the path of the field that bounces off mirror M2. Part of it is then reflected by the beam splitter, strikes this lens, and then comes the focus in the back focal plane of that lens, which is the front focal plane of the second lens that continues on, and then that's collimated, and so it projects a little plane wave onto the optical detector. So these two distances are both F2. So the front and back focal planes, this distance is F1. And let's see, let's put that label up here. And this distance is also F1. So we uh, get focusing of uh, this plane wave down to a point and then collimating into, back into a plane wave. Now what happens on the object? So on the object, all the little points on the surface are illuminated. So let's take one of those points. Each of those points is going to uh, emit a spherical wave. And part of that, half of that spherical wave will go through the beam splitter and strike this lens. It's going, to, because that distance, uh, provided H is set appropriately, so that that point is at a distance D2, so that it's at a distance F1 from this lens, it will then be collimated, go to the second lens, and then focus down to a point. In other words, that forms an imaging system. It images every point on this object onto a different pixel on the image sensor. Now, then what do we do? How do we get three-dimensional information? Because we're going to get a 3D imaging system out of this. So, suppose the object here, here's X, Y, and Z, the object has some profile Z of X and Y. So as we move the object, we change the H parameter, each one of these points on the object, which is imaged onto a pixel on the imaging sensor, will act as its own little movable mirror. And so if we look as a, at a function of the displacement of the object, h, and we look at any particular pixel, we're going to see an interferogram. And suppose we use a source here, g of t, which has a very short coherence length. Then one pixel might do something like this, and this is just a cartoon representation of what it would do. And another pixel might do something like this. And so this distance here would be the coherence length over two, the over two because of the round trip there. And let's see, we would get those fringes only when that particular point was a distance F1 from this lens, so that it's at the same distance as the mirror, so that you get the interference between those two paths. So that would mean that D2 minus H, and then right, if Z is positive, so this towards a, toward the beam splitter, this total distance from the beam splitter to that point would be D2 minus H 
minus z, and you want that to be about equal to d2. So that would mean that z was about equal to minus h. So right here, if this, say, was pixel 1, and this uh, pixel 1, and this was pixel 2, then these fringes would occur when h was about equal to minus z1, the z value of that particular pixel. So say here was pixel 1, and uh, maybe over, over here is pixel 2. And so pixel 2's interferogram will have fringes when h is about equal to minus z2. So what you end up with, if your imaging sensor, for example, has a million pixels, you get essentially one million Michelson interferometers, each operating on one of the resolution cells on this object and forming an interferogram in each pixel. So we would have one million signals, one million interferograms, and we could go through each one of those, obviously with a computer, and determine when we see these oscillations that would fix the uh, the z value because it would give us that um, z plus h is less than or equal to uh, half of this length so that would be coherence length over four and that would give us the third dimension of imaging now the x and y that would be the z coordinate the x and y coordinates would be imaged by this imaging system so in this plane we get x and y so we have that when id now is not a function just of h, but also of x and y, because it has it's resolved spatially into pixels. So when that shows fringes, like we've illustrated here, then the pixel at that particular x and y value has the magnitude of z of x and y plus h less than or equal to lc over 4. So we can determine the z coordinate to about one quarter of the coherence length of the source. And we can choose sources that uh, have a small coherence length as we desire. In fact, even more conveniently, some laser diodes uh, will have a coherence length that is a function of the current. And so what you can do is turn down the current and you get less coherence length. So you can actually program in the coherence length. Moreover, this amplitude of these fringes um, is, so let's call this A1 and this A2, is proportional to the amplitude or the brightness of the corresponding point on the object. So you also get that the fringe amplitude is proportional to a of x and y. And so you put those all together and you get a 3D image of the surface. All right, you resolve an x and y by this imaging system, like just a normal two-dimensional image. You resolve in the z coordinate from the interference patterns, finding when the fringes appear as a function of h, and you get the brightness of the pixels by looking at the amplitude of those interference fringes. Right here is an example of the output of an optical coherence radar. Uh, in the PDF lecture notes, uh, we give the, the reference to the paper that this is from. And this is a human fingerprint. And so you see a two-dimensional image, the brightness corresponding to the brightness of each corresponding pixel on the fingerprint. And then this line labeled A here, down here we show um, the Z coordinate, so the profile in and out of the page along that direction. Of course, the optical coherence radar would give you Z values for every pixel in this image. So you would have a three-dimensional image. Here you've got... Uh, resolution of a few microns. Again, you can vary that by changing the coherence length of the source. Now, arguably a much more uh, 
impactful technology is a slight variation of the optical coherence radar, and that is called optical coherence tomography. And basically, at least conceptually, uh, there are a lot of technical changes, but conceptually, the only difference is instead of using a, a hard object with a well-defined surface, instead, we replace the, uh, the surface by a transparent or at least partially transparent volume. So now here is where before we had that uh, hard object that defined a surface. Now this is just a transparent volume. X, Y, and Z. And this is H. We move that sample as put it in place of the movable mirror. And now the incident field completely illuminates the entire volume. It just it travels through and illuminates all points within the volume. So the, the coherence length now through the interferogram is going to pull out and give you fringes only for those parts of the volume that fall within a particular slice. A slice for which Z plus H is less than or equal to the coherence length over 4. So now, as you move this, this guy along and you measure these fringes, uh, at any particular H where you're observing interference fringes, you, if you just pull out the amplitude of those fringes, right, you're still going to get resolution in X and Y just as you did in the radar case. Uh, but now you're going to get that resolution, and the resolution in Z is going to now just cut a little slice. And that's what tomography refers to measurements of slices, it's going to cut a little slice out of that object. And then you could just move through the entire object and get slice after slice. And so over here is an example of that with false color uh, applied to imaging a, a retina uh, in, in a living human's eye. Now, obviously, uh, there's one of the technical details. If this was somebody's eye, the back of their, their retina, uh, you wouldn't want to ha move an, a human being back and forth at a few microns at a time. So you'd, you'd change the, modify the system so that uh, you'd have a different way to implement the, the path differences. Right? So that's just a technical detail. But here's an example of a, of a resolution uh, that you would get in a system of this form. So here, say, is the y-axis, x coming out of the board, and z up. And you're seeing uh, the different layers in the retina. So many uh, uh, diseases of the eye involve uh, dis uh, disassociation of pieces of the retina, etc., and, and fluids filling in. And you can see that very clearly with this optical coherence tomography, OCT. So widely used um, by, by eye doctors. And um, very important for um, diagnosis of problems with the, the retina.